Mark Cuban, how you doing, sir? Good, ET. How you doing, my guy? Oh, I'm good, man. Thanks for coming on the rematch uh, with Fly TV and BasketballNews.com. I really appreciate you taking out the time. You know, anytime. I got you. You know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, our connection and how far we go back. Because I, you know, it's funny because someone just recently said this to me. And I was like, yeah, I guess a lot of people don't know that. But I was your, your first pick. Um, that yeah, you made first draft the first yeah, draft pick, first right? Draft. And then the first pick. So then we had, you know, Courtney Alexander, and we had yep. Eduardo Nahara, prior yep. to Mexico, and then yep. uh, Donnell Harvey. So we were the first class, you know, that you ever drafted uh, after you took over in 2000. <laughs> and I got a picture of all four of you guys and me in my office from that very first time y'all came into Dallas. So that was fun. No, no, no. You know, it's funny because after we, when, when you picked us up from the from the draft and you took us there, uh, took us to Dallas, and we were all in our suits, and you wanted to show us the new arena. It was in construction. And so when we was there, I was like, man, I'm getting dust on all my nice suit. You know what I mean? But you were so happy, so proud, so excited, like a kid in the kitchen. I was, man. You were, you were I all the way excited. Not, well, I was always fired up back then, boy. It was, it was crazy. You know, it was my first my first real season, right? In my right. first full season, um, owning the Mavs, and so right. yeah, it was crazy. I, I was, it, 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 I, I think back to those days all the time. It's just how crazy it was. No, it was great, and that was a special group. Um, you know, and and you know, we had a lot of veteran leadership there. So you know, I was young coming in, and we had you know, of course, Dirk and Steve Nash, and we had yep. Michael Finley <laughs> and Greg Butner and. And, you know, uh, G. Trent, Sean Bradley, you know, Christian Layton. Yeah, those were a lot of vets. I just was just kind of watching how they do everything. That was a good group of guys. It was a great group of guys, man. And that's what turned us around, right? That's yeah. how we got back on, on the train to winning. And so right. you guys helped lead the way. Oh, no, that was great. Now, I got to ask you this question. You know, I got You know, it's, it's basketballnews.com. So I'm technically supposed to be focusing on basketball, even though I talk about a whole lot of other stuff. But I got to ask you this. Um, you know, it. Do you see in Luca and Porzingis um, as having the potential, not not comparing, but having the potential to reach a level of Dirk Nowitzki? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're different, right? right. Dirk was a scorer first, where Luca and a pure shooter. Um, whereas Luca is not a pure shooter yet, but he does everything else. He can score, um, but he but he does more, right? And the game has changed a lot since Dirk first came in um, or left even a couple of years ago because now, you know, back in the day, you, you'd want a point guard setting up Dirk, right? We'd put Dirk on the elbow and have all kinds of action off of him and right. or he'd run the pick and roll with Jason Terry or whoever. Right. But now you want your star being able to bring the ball up and get you into the action. Right. And because there's so many shooters on the court, be able to take it to the rim and finish or create for others. And so – Luca has the ability to do all those things, and as right. his shot improves, I mean, there's there's no limit to what he can accomplish. No, oh, I, I definitely agree. So I got to ask you, you know, because Steve Nash was there, you know, when I was there, and you know, I kind of look at them. You know, so for a while, we I just interviewed Jeff Green, and I asked uh -huh. him, and I asked him what the Thunder could have been if they kept all those guys together, if they kept you know Durant and James yeah, Harden and Westbrook all them together. So I got to ask, you know, what do you think could have been if Steve Nash and Dirk kind of stayed together their entire career? You have to really rub it in, don't you? I just got to ask. Mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's my biggest mistake ever. Uh, Not even close, my biggest mistake ever. Um, you know, he had been injured the year before, and his minutes were declining, and our doctor was like, you know, he's, he may have some issues. Mm -hmm. And Coach, you know, Nelly was like, he may have some issues. Um, and so we made him what we thought was a great offer, but then Phoenix came in and just, mm -hmm. just beat that offer. And I'll never forget because he called me up and he goes, they offered me more than Mike Bibby. You know, Mike Bibby had just gotten a big contract. Right. And I had him down on this, this um, calendar thing in my office still at the arena. I refused to move it. It's still there where it says Nash, Mike Bibby money. And I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, my biggest mistake ever, and and Nash hated me for a long time because oh, of it. But, I oh my god! Yeah, yeah. I hate maybe too strong a word, oh, but we're yeah, yeah. I don't want to back, back at it now. Yeah, really. But but y'all are good now, though. Now that yeah, we're good now. Yeah, we're good now. Okay, well that's good to hear. At least I, mean, I think we, we, we finally got a little bit. 
Oh, really? Okay. Well, that's good. Well, listen, we, we have, you know, exchanged messages, you know, for the past few weeks, ever since everything has kind of happened. And, you know, it's been an eventful summer. There's been a lot of stuff going on. The NBA players, you know, went on strike after um, Jacob Blake was shot seven times. Um, you know, we watched George Floyd, you know, murdered um, by, you know, Officer Derek, Derek Chauvin. Is that his name? Chauvin, who was like yeah. kneeling on his neck, you know what I mean, for eight minutes. Uh, we watched Armored Arbery you know, be hunted down and we watched, you know, uh, we got so many different cases. I want to know, first of all, how did they affect you personally? Like, how, what was your response at seeing, you know, Breonna Taylor, seeing all the different cases that happened? Um, what impact did they have on you? You know, George Floyd had the biggest impact because that was just straight out murder with everybody watching, mm. you know, and that that was just in incredible to me to see a man die on a video camera while people watched, while there were police officers around, where there were people taping it. And it was just like, you know, it just hurt. And, and you know, it didn't, it, it didn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, to give you an honest answer, you know, some of the others didn't, didn't have as much of an impact to me because it wasn't as personal to me okay. as it may be to you or to other African Americans. Right. But, it did, but it, did to, it did contribute to the understanding, right? Because when, when lots of people come out and say, well, you know, it's, it's not as big a problem as they're making out. And then there's just one time after another time, after another time, after mm -hmm. another time mm -hmm. where just African-American men and women now are, are just, it just seems like they're being hunted. And so, you know, George Floyd really hit me hard um, and just made me just a lot more aware and a lot more sensitive to the issue and a lot more, you know, desire wanting to have an impact and wanting to try to help where I could. And and what what was your response to seeing the NBA's response? A lot of the players have been using their their platforms to really speak out and bring light to this issue. You know, I think um, it's great. Okay. No, I, I'm very supportive because look, you know, every generation or every couple of generations has moments in time that are defining um, elements, defining actions of those generations. Mm -hmm. You know, we look back at Martin Luther King and the marches and you know, so many different things and speeches that really were defining acts that really led to a lot of change with civil rights. And then here we are almost 60 years later, and a lot has changed, but not enough. And so this really felt like it was a chance to have an impact and leave a lasting impression. And most importantly, start to, to move towards change. And because it felt that way, it, it really made it clear that this was bigger than basketball. And right. that because we have our players with you know, the biggest platform of any athletes in the country, mm -hmm. you know, and in many cases, the world, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it made perfect sense to use those platforms to try to, to change something that really needs to be changed, to, to really have an impact on racism, to really have an impact on police reform. So I was proud of them. I mean, I'm very supportive. Of and, you know, and, and recognizing, like you and I have talked, that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Definitely. And so I, and the way that we started um, communicating a little bit more again, I wrote a piece in The Guardian and um, it was titled uh, Words Aren't Enough. Uh, sports team CEOs must use their influence to affect change. And so in the in the in the piece, I was um, calling on people like yourself, you know, CEOs. I, I don't I don't call you owners. We, we talked about that before, but, <laughs> but we, we um, you know, CEOs like, you know, Clay Bennett in Oklahoma. Steve Ballmer and Jeannie Buss in L.A., James Dolan in New York, you know, um, Mick Arrowson in Miami, really to use their collective power to really push for change even more. Because I was I was seeing all the things that was happening and it was great. But then it was like after George Floyd, there was it, was, uh, it almost seemed like the police got more aggressive. You saw more cases coming out and more, you know. And so I was like, OK, you know, change isn't happening fast enough. And what I what I like about you, you didn't take it personally you didn't get like no. offended by my 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 words and my article but you messaged me and we started talking about it talk to me a little bit about some of your your reactions from it yeah i mean I, like i told you i don't think we have as much influence as you think we do mm. you know I, I wish we did i wish we could go to politicians i wish we could go to the president and just say well the president maybe put aside as a different beast but you know right. to go to our politicians and just say look this is wrong you know let's do a b or c and you know, but the reality is I, I, I don't have that influence. If I did, there's a hundred things I would try to impact and a hundred things I would try to change. In addition to racism, in addition to pre police reform, there's so many, you know, just housing and food shortages and, and kids not getting educations. There's a thousand things that, that need change. 
Um, I just don't have the type of influence that, that, and other owners, I don't think do either that you, you suggested that we need to have. Um, and it's, a, it, it's just the reality. So, um, so let me ask, so let me ask you this. So this, let me read a little bit about what I said to talk about a little bit, you know, specifically. So I said, um, you know, sentiments of support and solidar solidarity were a good start, but it, it's a time for, you know, the billionaires in in control of sports teams to wield their power to bring about tangible changes in their communities. So this is what I suggested. I said, what if NBA CEOs took proactive roles in their respective cities and pressured police departments to move towards specific uh, reforms and more police accountability? And I said, it's not as if men such as Mark Cuban or Mickey Arison in Miami are lacking in clout in the cities where the, their teams play. They are billionaires. You know, not millionaires like the players who have been doing an amazing job protesting, but billionaires with a B, which is a whole different level of influence. And then more specifically, I said, so what if in the NBA and team CEOs use their influence to pressure cities to threaten to cut the funding of police departments if they didn't adopt tangible police reform and police accountability measures? And I said, I bet you would see results as immediate as what you saw in Washington with the now Washington football team. And the, the, what I'm referencing is how, you know, Dan Snyder was not going to change the name regardless. He made it very right. clear. But then you saw um, FedEx say, well, if you don't change the name, you're going to lose us as a sponsor. And then all of a sudden, he, he, he saw the light. Now it, right. it was changed. And I also relate that to Donald Sterling. You know, Donald Sterling was Donald Sterling for a very long time. Long time I yeah. mean, you know, it, it was very well known. Very well known. Was. He had the, he had the, um, what do you have the the record for the most um, uh, discrimination cases against him in, the, in L.A. for that was and that's for a decade, but then you saw sponsors pulling out after that tape came out and well, everything. Like that. You, you're saying it the other way, right? You're saying you can influence the owners, right, more than we can influence the politicians, whether they're local or national. No, no, no. I'm saying so. So you in Dallas, you know what I mean? I'm saying Clay Benton and Bennett in Oklahoma, the places where you are, where the team is. Where you have, where you, you know, go to events and have different, um, you know, dealings with this certain level of, of circles to use your influence to be able to, you know, convince the city then to say, okay, you have to have this police reform or some type of measure of police reform or what, you know, and that it, it was just a suggestion. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly what I did. I don't know if mm -hmm. I said this in our messaging. Right. I met with the, the Dallas chief of police and I've got a great relationship okay. with the police. Right. Um, so, you, I, don't, I don't know if you, maybe I messaged you, but like after 7 7 16, where the five officers in Dallas were killed, right. we worked very closely. You know, I paid for overtime for officers to, um, to add services in Oakland, you know, at, particularly after the Pulse um, shooting in um, Orlando. There was a lot of, a, a lot of activity and a, a lot of, what's the right word, um, violence in and around Oak Lawn to LGBT community. So I paid for overtime there. And then after um, Chief Brown left, we hired him at the Mavericks. I hired him to, to work on programs to try to connect kids to have better relationships with officers. And then he left last year um, to take on another job. But, you know, that gave me the relationship to talk to Chief Hall, the chief of police. Okay. And we had a conversation. Now, you know, defund police can mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big believer in disrupt police mm -hmm. because I don't I think the challenge is not so much police funding, even though that's part of it. The challenge is that we have all these different um, stakeholders trying to have an impact on community and it's all disorganized. Mm -hmm. And the police uh, police um, try to do too much. Right. Yeah. So you've got the police trying to do things that, you know, they, they have community programs, which on mm -hmm. the surface sound great. Let's get to know kids better and connect them with the police. Well, hospitals have community programs. Churches and synagogues and mosques have community programs. Uh -huh. um, schools have community programs. The, the city and the county have community programs. Charities have community programs. So you have these 20 different constituencies trying to all do the same thing to make communities safer, to do these things called, um, um, oh, I can't believe the, um, the right, phrase but they're doing these things to try to make the communities healthier yeah mm -hmm. the communities healthier and safer and better educated but they don't work together so what i said to the chief of police 
we need to get you connected with all these other organizations so that you can take that money out of your budget because you're being asked to do things that you're not really great at, which is going through and offering these community services and have that money go towards, you know, organizing all these other groups so they work as one unit so that we can really have an impact because the whole goal is to make these communities not just safer, but you make them safer by, um, you make them even more safe by improving their education, by improving their health care, um, by improving the, their housing circumstances, by, you know, removing, making it so they don't go hungry and kids get fed and there's daycare. All these things go to being the social determinants of health. That's, that's the phrase I was trying to think of that make um, communities safer. And that all ties back to the issues with the police department. And what I told them again was there's, you know, there's things that no organization can be great at everything. None. Mm -hmm. Right. And the police are trying to do too many things when they need to focus on the two or three things mm -hmm. that the community needs from them that they can be good at and get good at that. And then when you talk to them about that and then you start saying, okay, well, what's the next step? You know, then they start talking about the politics of it. Nobody wants to see their budget reduced. Right. But, but I had this conversation with them and they said they were going to take a look at it. Never heard back really in any depth other oh, than wow. they're looking yeah. at it. But at the same time, I also had the conversation. I'm like, look, on a basketball team, we know who the knuckleheads are, and you try right. to limit the knuckleheads, right? right? You've had teammates that you knew were crazy. You, mm -hmm. you played on one team where half the team mm -hmm. went nuts, right? right, right. And, and so you know who the knuckleheads are. And I said, mm -hmm. in your police department, do you know who the knuckleheads are? And she's like, of course. I'm like, well, why can't you get rid of them? Right. And she goes, you already know the answer. You know, the unions or in Dallas, it's not so much a union. There's associations that do everything possible to protect them. And then there's, you know, they've, they've got these immunity issues where they're, they're not, right. you know, as much at risk. And, and so there's all these different elements that make it, a, you know, a, a very in-depth and difficult issue to address. And that's right. not meant to make excuses, but those are the conversations I'm having you know, and when I talk to them and, you know, it looks like we're going to get a new police chief in Dallas um, because um, Chief Hall is, is resigning, I think, in November. Um, then we'll have the conversations again. But I think, again, you and I have talked a lot about how sometimes the narrative changes everything, right? People end mm -hmm. up believing one narrative versus another, mm -hmm. and that makes it difficult to get things done. Mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge is while defund the police sounds really good, Mm -hmm. disrupt the police is what's really needed. You yeah, need to change the game so that, that communities can be made safer in a way that communities want to be policed as opposed to just saying, you know what, let's just cut it out and re re reformulate it from ground up. See, the problem, though, is, and we talked about this a little bit in our messaging, the problem is, you know, people who are dedicated to misrepresenting what the message really is. Um, people know the difference between the word defund and abolish. They're not synonyms. They're two would, very different words. No, and, you're right. People do know the difference, right? right. But that's not the narrative, and that's the challenge. That's what you face right. when you try to get things done. And, and that's true. And so, but for for instance, and I give I use myself as an example. Um, you know, I don't I don't have the clout that you have in Dallas, but I have a relationship in Syracuse, right? So a lot of things happened in Syracuse last semester, um, and a lot of bad things. So I have a meeting with the um, DPS uh, chief. And so I'm going to meet with them. I'm going to have I'm going to have a town hall with them. But then I'm going to have a different different things where um, I make suggestions. I talk about the the police hiring, the way that they have police accountability, what they are actually doing when they if they find a bad apple, how they're protected, how we can better implement different things so there can be trust within the students. Because right now the black and brown students do not trust DPS on no, I believe campus. It. Right, they do not, and they have very good reason not to. So, so making that inference right now for the, in, say, in Dallas police, I mean, after, you know, Buff and John happened and all these different things happened, you know, a lot of people, the community in Dallas don't trust the Dallas police departments and have reason to. So, so a lot of times people need to know what are the measures that are being um, taken for police accountability, for the bad apples that you mentioned. Right. For right. When okay. Let me just let me jump in. Right. Because a lot of that. So as a business guy. I mm -hmm. put on my business hat and I say, okay, let me get to the bottom of the problem. Mm -hmm. When there's an, like we've had, I've had organizations that have had problems and how mm -hmm. do you get to the bottom of it, right? Mm -hmm. More often than not, it starts with culture and then you look to see what 
what the issues are within that culture that are, are creating challenges and creating problems and creating the people that aren't doing what's in the employee handbook, aren't living up to the ideals. Right. Because when you have, I think there's 3,000 people in the Dallas Police Department. Mm-hmm. When you have 3,000 people, that's hard to manage. When you have, in organ, you know, as, and within those 3,000 police, I don't know how many active duty officers there are at different levels, but just the nature of that business is hard. And the reason I bring this up is not to make an excuse for anybody, okay. right? The idea is that when you're, when you're looking from change on the outside, and trying to ask the questions to drive change on the inside, you need to ask the right questions. Because it's not that what you're saying isn't right. Of course it is. The problem is, and what we've seen time and time again over decades, mm-hmm. is that they already know how to answer those questions just to buy time. I got right? As opposed, as opposed to saying, you know, here are the action items that I am going to commit to mm-hmm. that create change. Mm-hmm. Because they can train more, but who's doing the training? Okay. Right? They, you know, they can, they can hire better with better qualifications, but if the people that are, um, that are still managing and training aren't, you know, aren't doing it the, the right way, it's not going to change. And even bigger, if you bring in those newly hired people who have better backgrounds, have been better trained, mm-hmm. and they come into a culture where it's a macho culture, you know, guys are about, you know, violence is a cure-all, right, you know, there, you, you clean up the streets through violence and through, you know, through intimidation, like some police departments, you know, you're just bringing these newly better educated and better trained officers into an environment that the environment's going to swallow them and they're not going to be able to change. Because right. remember, think of it this way. And we talk about the bad apples in every police department. Mm-hmm. And let's just say it's 1% or 2%. Okay. There's a reason why the other 98% aren't standing up and demanding change on doing things, right? And to me, that's the harder question to answer. What is it that's presenting, preventing the 98% from taking action to stop the only 2%? And you saw it in sports teams too, right? Mm-hmm. You know this dude's a knucklehead, mm-hmm. and you know he's, gonna, he's messing things up for all of us, mm-hmm. but nobody really says anything or does anything for whatever reason. But, and so, so I'll, turn, I'll ask you, E.T., mm-hmm. you know, how do you get that 98% Mm-hmm. to change, to so, have the weight over the 2%, the 1% or 2%. So correct me if I'm wrong, but in every, every um, championship level team, every, every quality team, they have leaders on the team that hold everybody else accountable, aside from the coach, aside from the GM, aside from, you know, as you hopefully, go up. And, right. right, hopefully. That's what, but you're right. That's what makes a championship team. Right. But there's 29 teams. There's 29 other teams all tied for last, right? And, but everybody still has to be able to go uh, and, and act accordingly in order to, uh, under some of the guidelines and rules that say You're somebody right. like Adam Silver <laughs> set for everyone. So, so, so whether they're knuckleheads or not, if they fall out of line, then they're punished. And I think the problem is that right now, or what we're looking at when we're talking about police, it looks like they're going unpunished and have a license to do whatever no, they want to do. I agree with you. I agree with you, right? I, we're agreeing that, that mm-hmm. it's a problem and they're going unpublished, unpunished. The question becomes, how do you get that culture? How do you get that person in charge? And how do you get the, how do you get it? So they have the authority. The police chiefs have the responsibility to um, keep everybody in line and have everybody moving forward and doing things mm-hmm. the right way. But mm-hmm. they don't always have the authority to be able to get rid of those knuckleheads if they step out of line. And a lot of that has to do with the unions yeah. and associations, right? And that's the challenge that really is underpinning a lot of these issues. Because I think 98% of people want to do it the right way and their heart's in the right place, but they just don't have the authority in order to make those changes. And so, like, when I talk to the chief of police now and before, right, they're like, Mark, we would change it in a heartbeat if we could. They don't want to deal with this shit, right? They don't want to face this. So how do mm-hmm. we as influencers in one way or the other, try to get them to change. Right. I don't have that answer right now. You know, I, I, I can talk to I'm blue in the face and that's what I've done. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I, I can say, here's who you should vote for. And here's who you shouldn't vote for. Mm-hmm. And that has a big influence as well. But there's such an ingrained, you know, you know, the history of police forces in this country and, mm-hmm. and how they tie back to slavery and going out and trying to find slave, you right. know, and then, you know, in the early 1900s, they were immigrants that were put on the on the case, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so, just there's there's a long period of ingrained um, 
challenges, right, that are need, cultural challenges that need to be overcome, particularly in urban police forces that have been very, very difficult, you know. And so when we walk into this, you know, I think it, it's we can't just say, OK, here's the questions. What are your answers? And expect to get results. Right. right? right We've right. got to find a, a better way to dislodge because, you know, I'm not a union expert, a police union or association expert, right. but a lot of shit points back to the, the fact that it's very difficult to fire the people mm -hmm. that aren't following the rules. And I don't know how we change that, but that's, I think, part of what we need to address. And I think part, you know, part of that is the, um, the George Floyd law that's being proposed and, mm -hmm. you know, there's things built around part of that. But, you know, those are the conversations that when you talk to them, like when I talk, it's like, how do we change that? Because, Everything else they want to change, mm -hmm. you know, it's the things that they haven't been able to change that need changing the most that have the big impact. You know, we're, we're running to, into that same issue at Syracuse with the um, DPS or the unions that was just brought up. So it's very similar. Um, and when I say we, we started a group called the Black Oranges and they're um, former Syracuse athletes. So we're trying to use our collective power and influence to be able to to help push for different things of accountability and things of that nature. So that's the, co um, the correlation that I'm making. And I think that you're right as far as the unions part and defining what the issue is and then working with them and then making suggestions as far as how and how they can improve relations and improve accountability because it's not just relations it's not a lot of times the police departments they say okay well let's go into these schools and talk and officer friendly and all that stuff that's all cool but what we people really want to be able to see is that if a police officer kills someone they will be held accountable of course yeah that's, of course that's really yeah. what it is well, you want it so they don't kill anybody in the first place or of hurt course. anybody in the first place, right? Of course. But yeah, but if if it if the unfortunate happens and and this tragedy happens again, and you know it will, mm -hmm. right? Then, yeah, I mean, you can't have that the immunity levels that officers have. It's just right. not the way, not the way it should work. You, there shouldn't be an automatic protection of them. Look, they they should have every right afforded every American citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, right to a fair trial, etc. Mm -hmm. But they shouldn't have more rights, <laughs> exactly. you know, exactly. but above should, the law. <laughs> yeah, it should be above the law. I just don't know how to change that. And that right. I'm open to all suggestions because if you guys figure it out or anybody figures out, you know, let's, let's share it and, and get it done. I just don't know. Well, I definitely commend you. And like I told you, when we was messaging each other. I commend you for being open to trying and trying, you know, yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, you, you always started off by saying, look, I don't have as much power as you think I do. And I, I, I hear you on that. But you do have power and you do have yeah. influence and you are definitely an influencer. So I, I, I commend you for, for doing that. Um, I think you brought up a good point. When we were talking one time and you said that the, um, the narrative is changing and people need to know. You asked me who should people look to as the leaders? And I thought that was a really good question. You know, because you said some black, right, black lives matters, right? Right, it's right, right. Like, explain to me what you black lives matters. Mm -hmm. yeah, explain to me what you was asking and why people, you know, well, I can tell you what I hear from white people, right? Right, particularly, yeah. Yeah, particularly from those who are in the Fox News bubble. Okay, right, is that they go? They used to go to blacklivesmatters.com, dot com, mm -hmm. and they would say, "Well, if you look at the leaders of Black Lives Matters, mm -hmm. they're Marxists and they want to destroy the nuclear family because that used to be, and they actually changed it." They were smart. They just changed the blacklivesmatter.com website. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't reflect those things anymore. But they would use that as a way to try to influence the narrative and really just reinforce that they don't, you know, that they don't want to deal with this problem within that little filter bubble that they're in. Mm -hmm. And so with the, what was always brought up to me is that the people who invented the hashtag that ran blacklivesmatter.com must be the leaders. Right. And if they're they're if they're self-acclaimed Marxists, like they say in interviews and on that website, mm -hmm. then the Black Lives Matters movement must be a Marxist movement. Mm -hmm. And if they say they don't support the traditional nuclear family, then the Black Lives Matters movement must not support, must be a bunch of Marxists that support, you know, ending the nuclear family. And I'm like, that's crazy. Right. But at the, you know, it's crazy. I know it's crazy. Anybody who's supportive of the movement knows it's crazy, but it enables this filter bubble to, to dismiss Black Lives Matter's movement. So I asked the question, who's the leader? Because hey. there's nobody speaking up for BLM mm -hmm. to talk about the movement. There's nobody going into that filter bubble to say that you're wrong so that we get more support for the movement. Even mm -hmm. if that support is recognizing that 
okay, it's not a Marxist movement led by three people who created the hashtag. And 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 our our and we had a great conversation about this as well. And I told you that you know when when we say Black Lives Matter, we're not talking about the organization. It's right. way so much bigger than that. I'll give you an example. So just last night, uh, my my wife, you remember Nicole? She was, we were just got engaged. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. Right, right. So we're, we're we're married, three beautiful kids. And so last night, uh, my wife was um, um, braiding my daughter's hair. And it's a long process, but when she was sat down and we watched the Breonna Taylor story on Netflix. Great, great documentary. They did a great job with it. So afterwards, Imani's asking me questions. She was like, okay, so what's going to stop this from happening again? And she was like, so why doesn't her life matter as much, you know, enough for it to be valued? These are the questions that Imani's asking us, you know, where that the officer is held accountable for it. So she's asking me, all right, so what's going to happen to the officer? So what's going to stop another police officer from doing the same thing if they know they can get away with it? So then we explained to her what the what the police officer was charged with, and that it was um, um, wanted endangerment. Yeah, so for that, missing. Yeah, for, for missing. missing. <laughs> right, right. And, and she was like, "Wait a minute, how could that be?" And she was like, "So she was like, so that just tells us that our lives don't matter." So that's what we'd say when we say Black Lives Matter. Oh, you know no, I mean? no, 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 no. I, I know you're saying we we already had the conversation. I'm just saying that's what. So so getting that message because a lot of people, and I have heard people repeat what you said. And that can be further from the truth. So the people that I look at as the as the leaders and who I want to elevate as the leaders and keep pushing for the leaders and I've been doing work with are the family members of the victims of police brutality. Oh, Remember yeah. I told you about that. So I've been working with um, Emerald Gardner, who is um, Eric Gardner's daughter, and you know I, I interviewed them all for my book. And ever since then, I was in I was working with all of them. And Tiffany Crutcher, who is Terrence Crutcher's sister. And Eliza Castile and uh, Valerie Castile, who is uh, Flannel Castile's mother and daughter, and um, you know even even um, the the Fultons, uh, with Trayvon Martin's family, and so they all are pushing for legislative changes. All of them in their respective cities. They're not pushing for you know um, you know um, sensitivity training or being able right. to. They're not pushing for any of that. So specifically, legislative changes, and I I want to push them as the, the leaders, as the people who have the most, yeah. the, you know, being yeah. affected by all of this because they have, you know, they were, they were personally affected. They actually lost a loved one. And I think that for some, some of the things, immediately when something happens, the cameras go to them because they get the immediate reaction after the, the you know, the police officer was found not guilty or the, the killing just happened. And then they all go away. The, all the cameras go away, but they're left to really be pushing for justice for their loved one. So that's what that's what I and so I really want to push them as the leader. That's correct, right? To know? me, look, I can't be the one who decides that, right? Yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. You know, but I'll be supportive of anybody because in this day and age with social media and just general media, the way it works, people consume information in short sound bites, right. little short videos, right? And there's so much volume of those things. You need somebody that is there speaking all the time and all the places where conversations are being held right. and in particular you know it's not like you need to see them it's not like i need to see them it's right. the people who truly don't, don't understand what's going on that need to see them you need people who are going on fox news you need mm -hmm. them going on to you know breitbart or wherever some of these places are right and and really conveying what's at stake and why this is important and that's not to say that, you know, there's not going to be negative responses to some things because, look, the reality is, you know, and this might c come across as not being politically correct when, you know, like Charles Barkley said, right, if, if you're hanging out with a drug dealer, mm. right, you are going to be a greater risk. Not that mm. you deserve to be killed, not by a long shot, not that the mm. police officers don't deserve to be punished, not by a long shot. They were wrong in every way, shape or form. But there's things you can do to to not be in a position just like. You know, you tell your kids or I'll tell my kids, right? There, there's certain things you don't do. And so there's always going to be a response. And there's got to be somebody who's there to respond to those things, that to create a conversation. And that's missing right now. And I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And all the people you mentioned that are, you know, relatives of those who have been killed, they deserve a voice. Mm -hmm. But their voice has to be louder. And it takes, you know, leadership comes from people who want to lead, you know, people who want to communicate. And it's great that they're trying to work locally. That's that's amazing. Right. But there's got to be somebody with a bigger voice that's there all the time 
because this is a nonstop issue that's not going to go away. And it's, you know, you don't want it to start to fade off because you go through a period of time where someone doesn't get killed. Right. Mm. You know, you don't want people to say, well, see, it hasn't been a problem for six months or, or nine months, or it happened less this year than last year because the underlying issue or the two big issues that aren't going away anytime soon. And that's racism and, and police reform. And right. so you need somebody there to continuously, you know, hammer on these things and make the points and be the spokesperson and, and provide the information. Otherwise you're not going to communicate with the people that really need to hear it. And I think that one of the main issues is that you have people who are dedicated to misrepresenting the, the issues and dedicated to, um, you know, drowning the issues out. So that, that's a, a, a huge problem as well. Oh, yeah, That's what they do. That's right. I mean, you know, it's like, I'm not going to watch the NBA because they're, right. you know, You've got a Marxist organization represented right. on your basketball court. I'm like, dude, if this right. was about the, the website, you'd see a dot com there, right? Do you see blacklivesmatter.com? Right. Do you see right. that stupid? If right. this was about the, the people who started the hashtag, they'd be in every ad, they'd be on they'd be on every game talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening. So we know it's not it, we know it's disingenuous, right? Right, right. We know it's cut it's just a deflection because they don't want to deal with the underlying issue of racism. Mm -hmm. You know, because the reality is white people don't talk about racism and don't want to talk about racism. Right. You know, right. you don't want to talk about white privilege because no one's wa no one wants to think that they're pr wants to think that they're privileged. Right. You know, right. This, black people have no problem talking about racism. White people do. It's right. just very difficult. And so you get this deflection within those filter bubbles and you need somebody or some people that go into those bubbles and say, no, you're wrong. And here's right. why you're wrong. And you're, you're not going to convince most people because they're just going to, you know, turn a blind mm -hmm. eye to it. Mm -hmm. But if you get 5% or 10% and their kids don't become hate, you know, don't, don't receive the hate that mm -hmm. they might otherwise would or don't, aren't, aren't educated hatefully, that's, you know, that's part of progress. But you need leaders. I mean, yeah. when, we, when we look back in history, right, you know, John Lewis, Martin Luther King, whoever, we, we talk about leaders who have stood yeah. up and, and taken a position and, and taking on the risk to, to really move things forward. You know, who, you know, in 20 years, who are we going to look back at for BLM and said, you know what, they stood up for everybody when everybody needed someone to stand up for them. And, and, that, and that's where I think the, just seeing the work that the family members have been doing, I think they can become those leaders. I hope so. I, oh, yeah. I hope so. Right. And I'll help right. you any way I can to get them there, right? Right. You know, you know, I'll do I anything I can that, to help you to support you there. But it's got to happen. Right? I agree. It's just got to happen. And I, I again, I appreciate your willingness to be able to do that. I want to I want to ask you this. So so I, I want to ask you, you had on your mind that you were going to run for president for a while and then you kind of moved away from it. What 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 made you move away from it? Something all of a sudden happened. Oh, your family. Yeah. Okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> There's five of us. I got three kids and my wife and me, and the vote was four to one against. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then that, 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 because you were talking about it for a while, and then I didn't yeah. hear it anymore at all. So that's, that's what happened. Yeah, that was it, yeah. Interesting. So, also, you, you know, you've been speaking a lot of different places and talking about, you know, politics. And you've always, you know, I interviewed you for my book, We Matter Athletes for Activism. And we talked a lot about your willingness to speak out against Trump. And we talked about that a lot in there, but a lot has happened even since then. But you originally, you were supporting Trump, and yep. you know you you was complimentary of him. He was complimentary of you. It was like a whole bromance thing going on for a little while, right? But then no, it wasn't far. I was yeah, no, it was a little bromance going on, Mark. No. But then, no. but then, no. you know, but then you 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 changed. What caused the change? So a couple of things. First of all, Donald Trump and I go back almost 20 years, okay. right? When I, when I first met Donald Trump, it was at, right after um, I had sold my company and through a mutual friend, I got invited to a Super Bowl party down at Mar-a-Lago. Okay. And the place is beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's got this pool that overlooks the water and I'm sitting there, you know, it's just like a party, right? Um, and so I'm sitting there at a table with one of the guys from Yahoo who bought our company and a guy who worked for a bank. And, you know, like like anybody, a host would walking around to all the guests. Okay. And so Donald Trump doesn't know me from Adam, walks up to the table and there's this veranda where people in the club side of, of Mar-a-Lago were sitting. And he goes, hey, nice to meet you, Mark. You know, maybe someday you'll be sitting up there with the rich people. <laughs> and I'm like, 
okay, Donald, whatever, <laughs> you know. Okay. So I don't even care one way or the other. It's no big right. deal. Right. And then I have a TV show that came on um, in 2004 in ABC called The Benefactor. He sent me a note saying, uh, hey, congratulations. Oh, wait, I, I left out a part. So after that, he found out that I was involved in the internet, right? This is the early days of the internet, and we were leaders in streaming. Okay. He invites me to his office. I'm like, okay, you know, and he apologizes for what he said and all that. And he starts asking me these questions and brings in his, his internet guy. But, and it was all crazy shit. But the most interesting thing, you mm -hmm. know, because, you know, there's a process of learning how to be famous, right? Mm -hmm. Where you go from nobody knowing who you are to lots of people knowing who you are to almost everybody knowing your name or knowing mm -hmm. who you are, right? And I remember walking into his office, and when you go in there in Trump Tower, there's nothing but pictures of him, of him. on oh, yeah. every inch yeah. of the wall. <laughs> and, I, and I sent an email to my friends saying, look, if I'm ever famous, do not let me be this <laughs> dude, right? <laughs> and and then, then in 2004, my show failed. The Apprentice kept on going. And he sent me a note, I don't forget exactly, a letter, literally a letter uh, saying, you, you, your show was awful, you suck. <laughs> really? <laughs> for real, okay. for real. And then in 2007, I started the, the first all high-definition TV network called HDNet. Okay. And one of the things that we did was um, MMA fights. This is, this is 13 years ago. Okay. And he was doing an MMA fight with the Russians. Okay. Right, this, um, this, people, right? This Russian, <laughs> and, and so, and there was this Russian fighter, Fedor Emilenko, okay. um, who was really good at the time, and they wanted to broadcast it on on HDNet. And so, long story short, I'm like, sure, I don't give a shit. So, there's pictures of me with mm -hmm. Donald Trump in 2007, you know, fists up with this fighter, right? Yep, and Donald that. Trump on video, on video, saying everything Mark Cuban touches turns to gold. That's why we wanted. So, I went from, you know. Penthouse uh, to outhouse to right, penthouse. Right, right. That's who Donald is, right? Okay. If you're if you say something positive, he's your best friend. Right. So fast forward to 2015, okay. and I'm thinking there's no chance he has to win. None. Right. He has no chance to win. Right. None. Like and so I said, <laughs> yeah, like everybody thought. <laughs> I'm like, you know, Donald Trump's the best thing ever to happen to politics because he's not a typical politician. All he right. just says what's on his mind. He's not a Stepford candidate. Right. And he saw that, he and I was that. his best friend again. Yeah. Right. And right. so he would start calling me and calling me um, and we would talk. But no matter what I talked to him about, he never could understand it. And mm. no matter what I asked him about, he never got any smarter on it. And we're talking <laughs> basic shit. I mean, right. you know, real estate stuff. Like I remember right. asking him a real estate question about internal rate of return. Right. And I could just he, he, he didn't understand it. Right. And I'm just like, you know, and then I got to the point where it's like, Donald, at some point you have to learn this stuff. And I sent him an email saying just that because i said something on cnn that said the guy never learns anything i, I can't right. vote for him he sent me a note saying what happened and i told him at some point you got to learn shit right you're talking about running the country and now you have a chance to win mm -hmm. you literally got to learn what you're doing and that was the last i talked to him until until after he got elected and i was working on healthcare stuff and he invited me back to the white house again uh -huh. um so and so um, what actually Jared Kushner did, and he invited me into the Oval Office, which was hysterical. He's like, yeah, I know we had a little beef before, but I don't care anymore. But, you know, it, and talking to him is an adventure. But anyway, so that's the yeah. answer to your question. Okay, interesting. So, but, but now you're, you're in this election, you've been on record saying that you're supporting Biden. Oh yeah, hell yeah! Uh, I mean, I'm going for a ham sandwich over Donald Trump. Well, well, well uh, so, so I, I was watching you on The View. And you right. were talking about the um, economic policies of the Republican Party that are a little bit more um, beneficial to someone. In, no, that's not, not what I said. Not, that's not, not complete. So that's not 100%. Okay. All right, my bad. I didn't want to misquote you. Okay. You, you, you <laughs> tell everybody what you said. You tell everybody what you said. What you said was there, needs, there may need to be some balance that I might uh, vote for some down some down ballot Republicans mm. because one, I'm independent. I never vote straight party ticket on anything, right? Okay. And so they were giving me a hard time. How can I vote? You know, and right. I'm, look, there's some Republican, there's some economic issues coming from Biden. A lot of them I agree with. Some I, I disagree with because right. I think counterproductive to investment okay. for, it, you know, for all communities, not just minority communities. Okay. And so you know, things like um, taking the, um, I'll give you an example. Like he wants to take, and, most I'll say most of his economic stuff, like 
no taxes over 400, you know, no change of taxes if you make $400,000 or less, right? Right, right, right. That's me, right? right? Increasing okay. um, corporate income taxes to 28%. Okay. That's fine. Too. I got no problem with that. Okay. But the one thing I think is a huge problem is he wants to take um, capital gains tax and make it equal to your um, regular income tax and tax okay. it as regular income. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why that's bad. Capital gains is always taxed at a lower rate. You know, it's been 21 or 25 percent, as low as 15 percent. Just it varies by administration. Okay. You know, and in this range, that's all fine. I don't mind him raising it some. Right. But if you're paying 39 or 40 percent in income tax, like I'll like right now, I pay 37 percent. Mm -hmm. I pay 39 percent. Let me give you an example of why that's bad. Let's just say um, I invest in five companies and I give them all a um, million dollars. Mm -hmm. And four of them just run normally, right? You know, they don't make a ton of money. One of them does really good and we sell it and I make $7 million. Well, if I've invested five and I'm not getting returns on those other four, but I've created jobs, helped entrepreneurs, and they're running as normal businesses, employees and everything, mm -hmm. but I don't really get returns and that happens a lot, you know, but now I've sold this one company for $7 million where I'm making 7 million, but I'm only getting 60% of that. Okay. I'm only making 4.2 million back, okay. right? right? And so now as opposed to, you know, getting, um, eight times seven, 5.6 million. So it makes it harder w when you're making decisions on investing, you're going to be a lot pickier. You're going to make a lot fewer investments because the chances of getting your money back are far less. Okay. That to me is a real problem because you want to see risk capital. You want, particularly when it's 0% interest rates, particularly mm -hmm. if they're, they're investing in um, minority communities. Like I just mm -hmm. invested with a woman, Arlen Hamilton, where I gave her $6 million to invest in, you know, people of color and LGBTQ individuals who are typically not recognized as, and given the opportunity to get investment. Okay. I've invested over $50 million in minority owners and, and um, LGBTQ owners and women owners over the past four or five years. And so okay. that changes the calculus of doing those types of investments. On your return. I got you. I understand. And so, 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 so mostly, because because the Republican um, Party's ideals are a little bit different than Trumpism. You got to kind of put the two different, right? Yeah, so they're, so yeah. they're 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 very different. And well, he has kind of hijacked the party. So now it's his ideals and his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so so with Trumpism, for a lot of people, a lot of conservatives, a lot of people in the right, economic issues are outweigh the other issues. So what are some of the other issues that are deal breakers for you? So like, so like for instance, for me, you know, I'm, I'm in the top tax bracket. I'm not Mark, Mark Cuban level, but I'm in the top, top, top tax bracket. But that's not enough for me to say, okay, since I'm getting a tax break here with the Republican, um, you know, economic standpoint and the tax break plan, um, I can overlook the racism, the homophobia. Oh, no, 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 I'm just saying, but a lot of people can. So what are the, what are the issues, the deal breakers for you that even though from an economic standpoint point it might be been more beneficial for you to side more with the Republicans, why are you why could you not vote for Trump in this election? Why could I not? Oh, everything. <laughs> yeah, right. it's just everything. Like, the guy's an idiot, right? There's no leadership, right? No empathy. No, you know. Um, no ability to learn anything, no understanding of global politics, no understanding of technology, no ability to talk to people who don't agree with them, no ability to hire good people and listen to them. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. He's just incapable, right. you know, and, and that's the problem. Now, do I understand why people vote for him? I think there's two types of people, right? One are the people who just vote their pocketbook, mm -hmm. period, end of story. Right. And I understand it. I don't like it, but I understand it. And it's, you know, it's kind of hypocritical for me to say, okay, you shouldn't vote your pocketbook, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not, I'm going to be fine either way. Right. And the right. second is, if you're one of these people who think the world's, the country's coming to an end, mm -hmm. right? And everybody's out to get you. The pedophiles in Hollywood are out to get you, right? Mm -hmm. You're a QAnon person. Mm -hmm. um, the, the elites, whoever they are, are out to get you. Right. China's out to get us. Russia's out to get us. Everybody. And the only person who can stand up to all the people out to get us is Donald Trump. Right. Because, you know, that narrative on Biden has been, you know, 
he, he can't stand up to China. What has he done? Da, 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 da. Right. If you believe all that narrative, you're going to vote for Trump. That's, yeah, now, I that's, think that's craziness, but that's what, again, people in a filter bubble. I mean, you go on Facebook, you see the shit on Facebook. Right. I mean, it's some of the most ridiculous shit yeah. ever, yeah. ever. And people believe it. And you try to talk to them and say, and I say, look, I know the guy. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, he cares about America. He puts America first. I'm like, yeah, Donald right. Trump never yeah. gave a care about a motherfucker other than himself. He would throw right. his family under the bus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They don't listen. They, you know, because, again, there's just nobody, even on the Democratic side, there's nobody in the middle talking to those people. Right. You know, to try to get them to understand otherwise. So we all stay in our little social media filter bubble, you know, thinking that what we see in here is, is right. Like I saw somewhere on television the other day or maybe it was online where they were interviewing um, Trump supporters. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, they were talking about the fact that, you know, the FBI said that QAnon was one of the greatest domestic terrorist threats. And the guy says, you know, he talks to a QAnon supporter and the guy says, of course they're going to say that, you know, we know where all the bodies are buried in the FBI. So they're trying to hide. I mean, it's, it, it, it's ridiculous. You know, I was, I was watching you on Sean Hannity. And I, you know, I, I compliment you for going on Sean Hannity, even though you know, oh, right? That's where you got to go. Yeah, but it's tough because Sean Hannity has this way. He asks you questions and then doesn't let you answer. So well, of then course. He, we're right. But so he, he asked you a question a couple of times. You are talking about the coronavirus and then he cut you off in the middle and said, uh, you're like, you didn't even get your point out yet. Then he cut you off again. And I was just like, let Mark answer the question that you just asked him. <laughs> yeah, you know. It's not making the sausage is never pretty, right? And when you go into you go to the other side where you know everybody disagrees with you, right? You got to fight a little harder, and you got to be repetitive a little bit more, and you got to have the quick one-liners, right? But that you know you're not going to get many, but you know seventy-seven thousand people were the difference between Trump, Trump winning and losing across three states. Right. If I can do it enough and get seventy-seven thousand people to change their mind, the right seventy-seven thousand. Maybe it makes a difference. So I don't mind getting the shit. And boy, the emails I get, oh my I imagine. God. I, I You're talking about racist motherfuckers. I can imagine. <laughs> but, but, let, but let me ask you this, because y'all, because you didn't get a chance to fully explain yourself on there before he was trying to cut you off and everything like that. So if, and let me ask you, if, if Trump would have, because his point, what Sean Hannity point was saying, that, you know, Trump did this great job in saving New York. That's what, that's what he wanted to get you to say. And I was like, he's really pushing hard and trying to make you say those words. But correct me if I'm wrong, though, if Trump hadn't had, you know, called it a hoax in the beginning, not paid attention to it in the beginning. And we're going back to like February and going back to the rallies where he's urging people that it's just, you know, he said it's just a, it's just want to go away. Democratic hoax. Hoax. You know, it's, it's the liberals who want to just destroy me like that's the, the coronavirus was, you know, discovered or created to destroy him. Like that's how narcissistic he is. But if he didn't do all of that and, and paid attention to it back then, wouldn't that have been better for the entire economy? Wouldn't that would have yes. been better for the entire, yes. you know, we're at, we're at 200,000 deaths right now? I mean, Gee, right now, if, if, everybody, if everybody committed to wearing a mask right now, two seconds from now, everybody put on a mask every time they went out, we'd be able to open things up and the right. economy would improve. Now realize that when you like there's you should get this one dude on. He's an economist from Harvard called Chetty, C H E T T Y. Okay. And look up his stuff. The stuff's phenomenal. Okay. And he talks about the K recovery. For you and I, the recovery's pretty much back, right? Because mm-hmm. we can live our lives, we can go online and get what we need and do what we need to do. And we work online, right? We can we deal in the digital world. Right. For those people who are the essential workers, right? Oh, the people their, their, their unemployment rate is 16%. Their Definitely. economy is in the, is awful right now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for them, if everybody wore a mask, their economy is going to improve significantly right. because, and their health is going to improve significantly because as essential workers, they're not going to be nearly as ri- at risk. Now, one of the overall challenges, though, that nobody's addressing is the economy as a whole is becoming more and more digital. We're accepting digital a lot more readily than we did, you know, a year ago. Mm-hmm. And that's changing the economy. And so, you know, people are coming to sporting events. They're not going on trips. They're not going on con- going to concerts. They're not staying, you know, on in hotels as much, 
right? So the question becomes, is the change that's happened and taking us away from them, is that better in the long term for the economy or worse? Because you're seeing a lot of small businesses close, right. but a lot of that business has gone online. And so small businesses who have closed retail have more been created online because anybody with a laptop and an internet connection can, you know, go on Shopify or Amazon and create a business. That's are we true. ahead and are we going to be better off or are we worse off? And well, I don't know the answer to that right now, but that's a question we are not really exploring. They call that creative destruction. You well, know, you don't try to keep the, the horse and buggy businesses or the record labels or the, or the records or the CD businesses around right. because things have moved forward. Is that what's happening right now? What's the impact on different communities? Well, it's interesting because I, I, I find it interesting that, you know, that, that Trump was convincing people in red states, you know, that, that his supporters, these are his people, to open up early. And, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, you know, my family's from, from, from Tulsa. And, you know, he said, I, you know, I want everybody to open up by Easter. That was the time that he was saying. And then so you see all these red states opening up. Again, these are his supporters and his people. Then you see the numbers increasing. Then you see all the things, different things. Then he's pushing for the for the um, for everything to open back up. So then he's forcing people who ne who aren't really um, that confident in the same. You know, it makes it you. you know what makes that worse is uh -huh. southern states, red states like that, haven't adopted the Medicaid option for the um, ACA for Obamacare. Right, right, right. Because right. he wants to do away with Obamacare. Right, right. right. So right. what's happening is not only are more people getting sick. Yes. Right. Even though the percentage is lower than it used to be, right? More people right. and absolute numbers are getting sick. Right. They have no place to go for, for overall health care. Right. right? So yeah, they can get tests. Yeah, they can get, you know, they can get um, some care because they're not charging for, for all of the COVID stuff. They're charging for some. Mm -hmm. But generally, they're the, these are the states that, one, don't have access to Medicaid, which is crushing people right. that don't have, that, that um, aren't well off or even decent off financially. Mm -hmm. And two, of course, these are the states with the worst education in the union, right, mm -hmm. in the United States, right? right? So they're more susceptible for, to all this nonsense. And right. on top of that, because their education is so much weaker than, than other states, mm -hmm. you know, the kids that can't get to school don't mm -hmm. have the resources and the schools don't have the resources to open up correctly. So they're not getting the education. They're not, you know, and I don't have absolute data for this, but just anecdotally, that's what we're seeing. And, and but he's pushing for them to be open. See, here in Maryland, we're all closed. All our schools yeah. are virtual. You know what I mean? But down in Oklahoma, I talked to my friends. They're all open. And I know here in Dallas, they're open too. All, yeah, that's crazy right now. You know what I mean? It is right. Honestly, right. Honestly, like the schools that are well off, my kids, right? Private schools, uh -huh. masks, social distancing. Uh -huh. We can afford the, and the schools there to make sure it's done right, and okay. they're well, actually schools, safer. Though. Yeah, no, public schools are a different beast, right? Really different. And that's the point. And that's right. the point, right? right? They don't have the resources in order to do all this right. Now, you know, the good news is, if there is good news, is kids aren't as quite as susceptible. Right. And teachers are terrified enough that they're doing everything they can to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the number of cases hasn't been as astronomical as they could have been. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we don't know the long-term implications of just catching COVID. And that's the right? issue. That, that's my issue with college football. That's a whole different issue. We don't have to go down that route. You know what, you're tell, what you're telling me, T. So, you know, one of, one of the – and someone just told me this, so I'm just relaying. I can't take credit for it. Okay. Um, one of the things that happen to all, happens to almost all people that get COVID is that they lose their sense of taste and smell, right? Right, right. And, and it's supposed – everybody looks at that as being no big deal. Right. Well, what controls your sense of taste and smell? Your brain, okay. you know, their, their neurological systems control that. So by definition, if you right. had your taste or smell eliminated for some period, COVID has had a neurological impact on your on your brain, on your body, right? Definitely. So Definitely. we don't know what the long-term implications of even that are. And so it's not just about the fatality rate. It's about the impairment rate, you know, and we don't know what the long-term implications of that are at all. And that's all we know. Yeah, that's a big question that's a mark. Question. That's all right. I'm gonna get two more questions, and I'm gonna let you okay. out of here. I promise you. Um, you know, I I'm looking at Trump, and you know, I've asked one more question about Trump, but I'm looking, at, and you correct me if my interpretation of this is wrong. Okay, so if someone intentionally avoids paying their federal income taxes, right? <laughs> no, let's just just say you know hypothetically, I guess, right? And they're actually inflating their revenues and their assets, you know, on actual bank documents. 
and they actually receive loans, right? Um, wouldn't that be bank fraud and tax evasion? Well, good for you, Greg. Good for you go that direction. So the stuff that came out in the New York Times yesterday did not suggest that he broke the law with his taxes, okay. right? Did not, because they talked about tax avoidance. Avoidance is okay. Evasion is not. Right. People get okay. thrown in jail for tax evasion. evasion. But your point, right, mm -hmm. if I show you income taxes that aren't quite in order to get a loan and those numbers aren't quite right, you know, because right. – yeah, you fudge even just a little bit mm -hmm. and inflate them at all. Yep. That's bank fraud. That's why Michael Cohen went to jail. Right. Because he went to jail because and he didn't even try to inflate it. Right. They just got him by saying it wasn't 100 percent accurate. He didn't even inflate them. Right. And so if Donald Trump, I think they said they own 200, oh, 262 million that was due in the next year or, yep. or next few years. Right. Yep. Um, if he and there was only one bank that would loan to him, that's Deutsche Bank. Right. And, and Deutsche Bank is under investigation. They've paid billion plus in fines. Right. And so if the feds find that Donald Trump inflated on his tax returns, um, asset valuations, or tried to tie back in his um, application to the bank to get a loan, mm -hmm. faulty numbers that were in his, his, his um, tax forms, yeah, that's breaking the law. And you can go straight to jail. That's how they got Al Capone. <laughs> right. There we go. All right. Just want to make sure that I was clear. Yeah, you got that right. So you got that right. Okay. Last question for you. Um, the year you won a championship. Uh, it was a great year. Y'all had a great team. A lot of guys from the Wizards was there. You know, I, it, was, it was, I was happy seeing y'all, you know, win the championship. You had to smile from ear to ear the whole time, right? It was great. I want to ask you this, though. Um, LeBron James gets a lot of criticism for that series in particular. And I want to ask you, what is the difference that you see in him then in that series and then in him now? Because if you had to just compare, okay. 30, yeah, 30, 30 30 differences. what are some of the differences that you see? Yeah. So number one, um, he was the number two guy with the heat, right? It was Dwayne Wade that really was the, the leader. Like we talked earlier about having that leader in, in the locker room, right? right? Right, So you could really tell on the court and just from talking to guys that, you know, he went to Dwayne's team, right? It right. wasn't like, you know, Dwayne came to his team. Right. And, and so I think one is leadership. Now LeBron's that guy, period, end of story, mm -hmm. right? He, he, he says who comes on that team, how it's going to work, you know, what we're doing. And, mm -hmm. and two, he's got the basketball IQ level now. He's just take, he's, he's a basketball savant. Right. I mean, the way he sees and reads what's going on on the court in real time and is three steps ahead is incredible. And that's what makes him, in addition to his, his athleticism, that's really what makes him special. Hmm. And so he didn't have that. Like we would run a zone against him and he would hesitate and not be sure what to do. Right. He's not going to hesitate now. Right. right. He knows exactly what's coming and what to do and anticipates. You know, he can talk to you about a basketball game and every single play that mm -hmm. that's happened. Mm -hmm. Like some of us might talk about a book we just read, right? You know, right. and that that those two things are enormous differences. And you know, he can he can now beat you in so many different ways. He's still athletic enough. Um, he's still you know his his skill set has improved. His his passing, but those all tie back to his basketball IQ, and that's something that wasn't as developed then as it is now. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Hey, well, Mark, Man, I, we got everything, didn't we? <laughs> no, yeah, we covered everything. That, that's what I like, you know, I talk about a lot here. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've ever talked about that range of topics in one second, one, one interview. So, hey, I appreciate you sitting down with me, you know, and I, I really, I want to say honestly, I really do commend you for, for wanting and trying to be able to uh, move the needle with with this entire issue with police brutality and police you know accountability and everything so i i, I definitely commend you so i'm not learning et I'm, i've still got a long way to go i've come a long way over the last four or five years you know um six years there's just things that sometimes you're, you're slow on right because it, it just was it was foreign to me in a lot of respects right. you know understanding race understanding what you know african americans and, and minorities in general have to go through mm. understanding you know what happens with the police force and and you know the talks and just things that are so foreign to what white people have to deal with, and right. so because it's not your you know, reality, you don't have to deal it's with it. Yeah, right, right, you, right. Know, you just don't. And, and right. so, you know, it, it just took me some time, and and I realized that right now we're just talking, right? Mm -hmm. And there's still a long ways to go and a lot to do. So, you know, I'm going to do my best to keep on learning and, and trying to be supportive. 
That's good stuff. Well, I appreciate you. So you stay safe down there in Dallas and uh, good luck to you with everything. <laughs> don't listen to Trump. Don't, 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 listen, don't listen to Trump. Keep your mask on. Don't you already know the answer there. <laughs> All right. Have a good one, Mark. All right. Take care. Tony, All, right. Cool. I said. All right. Cool. I will. Peace.